Good morning. Today's lesson, message from the Word of God, will not be the beast from the earth. It will be from the book of Isaiah. So next week, maybe, we'll get another lesson from Revelation. If you have your Bibles, if you would turn to the book of Isaiah, Isaiah 49. And the focus of the message is going to be verses 1 through 6, but I'd like to go back to chapter 48, Isaiah 48, and start in verse 17 and read into that passage and get us some context. Starting in Isaiah 48, verse 17. This is what the Lord says, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. I am the Lord your God who teaches you what is best for you, who directs you in the way you should go. If only you had paid attention to my commands, your peace would have been like a river, your righteousness like the waves of the sea. Your descendants would have been like the sand, your children like its numberless grains. Their name would never be cut off nor destroyed from before me. Leave Babylon, flee from the Babylonians. Announce this with shouts of joy and proclaim it. Send it out to the ends of the earth. Say, the Lord has redeemed his servant Jacob. They did not thirst when he led them through the deserts. He made water flow for them from the rock. He split the rock and water gushed out. There is no peace, says the Lord, for the wicked. Listen to me, you islands. Hear this, you distant nations. Before I was born, the Lord called me. From my birth, he has made mention of my name. He made my mouth like a sharpened sword. In the shadow of his hand, he hid me. He made me into a polished arrow and concealed me in his quiver. He said to me, you are my servant, Israel, in whom I will display my splendor. But I said, I have labored to no purpose. I have spent my strength in vain and for nothing. Yet what is due me is in the Lord's hand, and my reward is with my God. And now the Lord says, He who formed me in the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him and gather Israel to himself, for I am honored in the eyes of the Lord, and my God has been my strength. He says, It is too small a thing for you to be my servant, to restore the tribes of Jacob and bring back those of Israel I have kept. I will also make you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring my salvation to the ends of the earth. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for your word that's living and active. Help us to listen to your inerrant, infallible word, to be obedient to it, to understand it. Lord, to worship you in our hearts and our spirits, in our minds and our attitudes and our actions. Father, as we go through this portion of Scripture this morning, teach us what you mean for us to know. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So this section of Isaiah brings into focus the topic of God's servant, his work, his task, and the details of redemption from sin. And in the chapters up to this, that's what Israel has needed throughout the whole book of Isaiah, is redemption from sin. So the title, God's servant. And if you look in your um, bulletin from this morning, you'll see... Next week in the morning, we're going to preach Isaiah 49, and guess what? You're a week early, so good for, good for all of us here. God's servant. And it shows us the themes of the task that is stated and the person or the individual named. And if you want to break that down further, you would say the what and the who. So after we get through this message, hopefully you will understand the what and the who of these first six verses of chapter 49. So to go back in time just a little bit, chapter 47 of Isaiah brings the argument regarding the futility of idolatry to a climax. It's a chilling picture of what will happen to the worldliness around us and those who bow to worldliness on the final day of judgment. Sadly, even in the church, many have made Jesus out to be anyone but the judge of all the earth. Chapter 48 showed us just how bad God's chosen people had become. 
It's a picture of us all apart from Christ. What hope does Israel have if there is no peace for the wicked? This next section in Isaiah encompasses chapter 49 and it goes through chapter 55. The message here clarifies that the servant is not Israel the nation because the servant will bring Israel back to God. This servant that God is telling us now in chapter 49, this servant will be given worldwide recognition. He will be a prophet, but more than a prophet because in him God will display his beauty or his splendor. His message will fall on deaf ears in Israel Yet the Lord will vindicate him. He is a light for the nations, bringing salvation to the ends of the earth. He will be given as a covenant to God's people, guiding peoples from every nation by springs of water and displaying God's comfort and compassion to all creation. Remember Isaiah, long ago prophet from the corridors of 8th century BC, Isaiah saw the coming of Jesus who would bring redemption and restoration. What the nation Israel needed was salvation. What Israel needed was a savior, one who would come outside of themselves. What Israel and Judah needed was a servant savior who would do what Israel could not do for herself. This is also our need. There's a new beginning in chapter 49 afforded by redemption from Babylon. We see in chapter 48, verses 20 and 21, I won't read those, that redemption from Babylon was necessary. And the unchanged relationship to the Lord expressed by the term, no peace for the wicked in verse 22 of chapter 48, shows where they were at. So this is the backdrop to the greater deliverance about to be enacted, the work of the servant of the Lord. The book of Isaiah for people that study it, contains four what are called servant songs. What they are are glimpses of the coming Son of God, their theology set to either music or poetry. One of those sections is Isaiah 42, the first four verses. We have it here in Isaiah 49, the first six verses. Isaiah 50, there's four verses there. In the Isaiah 52 into, verse, into chapter 53 is a longer um, song. So it's called, they're called servant songs, and they're about Christ. So I'd like to read verses 1 through 6 again, just verses 1 through 6. Listen to me, you islands. Hear this, you distant nations. Before I was born, the Lord called me. From my birth, he has made mention of my name. He made my mouth like a sharpened sword. In the shadow of his hand, he hid me. He made me into a polished arrow and concealed me in his quiver. He said to me, you are my servant, Israel, in whom I will display my splendor. But I said, I have labored to no purpose. I have spent my strength in vain and for nothing. Yet what is due me is in the Lord's hand, and my reward is with my God. And now the Lord says, he who formed me in the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him and gather Israel to himself, for I am honored in the eyes of the Lord, and my God has seen my strength. He says, it is too small a thing for you to be my servant, to restore the tribes of Jacob, to bring back those of Israel I have kept. I will also make you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring my salvation to the ends of the earth. The depiction of the servant in 49 mirrors the depiction of the servant in chapter 42. In fact, if you got your Bibles, just turn back to chapter 42 real quick. Isaiah 42. I'm going to read the first four verses. Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him and he will bring justice to the nations. He will not shout or cry out or raise his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. In faithfulness he will bring forth justice. He will not falter or be discouraged till he establishes justice on earth. In his law the islands will put their hope. That is a song about the servant. 
In chapter 42, it's a biographical song. It is from God's viewpoint. This will be my servant. Chapter 49, the first six verses, is an autobiographical viewpoint from the servant's perspective. In both cases, there's a spiritual need that cries out. Chapter 42, the four verses I just read, it shows justice, justice, justice. That is the need. Chapter 49 shows us that God has prepared the servant's mouth as he calls the whole world to hear. The focus is on salvation and revealing God. Notice in chapter 42 and in chapter 49, in neither case, is the servant a political figure? So let's look closer at verse 1. What we see is a worldwide audience. The summons is to the world in all its extent. He uses the world, the word islands. Listen to me, you islands. Hear this, you distant nations. Some versions of the Bible use the word coastlands. This is beyond Jerusalem. The word listen marks the speaker or the servant as a prophet. The words that follow immediately to me is not used by any prophet other than Isaiah. Listen to me. And in Isaiah, it is only used of the Lord. We see that in chapter 46, 48, 51, and 55. The words listen to me is God's servant. So how can the servant address the world as only the Lord would address them? So are we listening to God? Were they listening to God, to his inerrant, infallible word? Well, he goes on, he tells us, the Lord has called me from the womb. Verse 1 continues, called refers to position and function. From the womb, from my mother's belly, In regard to the Messiah, there is often a particular reference to his mother. It's interesting. If you turn to Psalm 22, Psalm 22, and I'm going to read to you verses 9, 10, and 11. And this is what it says, because I'm bringing up the idea of of a reference to the servant's mother. But you are he who took me out of the womb. You made me trust while on my mother's breasts. I was cast upon you from birth. From my mother's womb, you have been my God. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. The psalm writer describing the servant and the mother is linked in there. Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14, if you want to turn, fine, I'll read it, says, Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. We all know that from Christmas. We all know that. This is a reference to his mother again. He uses in verse 1 the term my name. What is the importance of a name? Matthew one twenty one says, and you shall call his name Jesus. You know God calls us by name? If we're his, he calls us by name. Verse 2, we have a description. It says, my mouth is like a sharp sword. The servant conquers through preaching. Isaiah is explaining using a warfare metaphor, the warfare of the word. God's words are effective. Isaiah 45, 19 says, I, the Lord, speak righteousness. I declare things that are right. Going back to the mouth, the word. He says, my mouth is like a sharp sword. The sharpness of a sword is its effectiveness. A polished arrow is accurate. Both of those terms are used here. Sword is sharp, polished arrow is accurate. A sword wins victories close at hand. An arrow hits distant targets. Verse 2 continues, His hand hid me in his quiver. It tells us there is personal preparation and care reserved for a chosen target, and it shows us the intimate closeness of the Lord and his servant.
So I'd like us to take a quick look, a little different look, at verses 1, 2, and 3. Because this is a song or poetry, if it's a song, we don't know the music. But we can look at the words. And I want you to see something. I'm going to leave away the first line or first two lines that says, Listen to me, you islands. Hear this, you distant nations. That's a prologue for what is coming next. So we're going to start with the the line, Before I was born, the Lord called me. So we're going to have a list A. And it says, Before I was born, the Lord called me. Or your version may say, The Lord from the womb called me. Then you're going to skip a line, and the third line will say, he made my mouth like a sharp sword. And you're going to skip a line, and the next line says, he made me a polished arrow. And you're going to skip a line, and the next line in verse 3 says, he said to me, you, my servant, are, or my servant, you are. So that one starts at birth, goes to a personal preparation for the ministry of the word, and ends with the title, my servant. The next list is list B. We will start with the line, from my mother's body, he mentions my name. Skip a line, in the shade of his hand, he hid me. You skip a line, in his quiver, he concealed me. And you skip a line that it ends with Israel, in whom I will show my beauty or my splendor or be glorified. So we see distinct truths in each of these. A starts at birth goes to personal preparation for the ministry, ends with the title, My Servant. B starts at birth with divine selection of a name. Then it goes to concealment. It means a secret kept for the chosen moment. In the shade of his hand he hid me. In his quiver he concealed me. And B ends with the revelation of the name, Israel. A, the calling leads to servanthood. B, having a name in mind, leads to the revelation of that name. Understand that God packs a lot of meaning in a few words. So giving the name Israel to the servant is the focus of the structure of these verses. Going on a little more detail in verse 3, Israel was the name of an individual before it ever became a national name. Remember at Bethel, and you see it in Genesis 28, verses 13 and afterwards, and in Genesis 35, Jacob received the name, and with it the blessing and responsibility of the Abrahamic promises. At that moment, he wrestled with God, and the weight of the world rested on his shoulders. Isaiah brings us full circle back to such a moment as he penetrates the secrets of the Lord's age-long workings, the giving of the name to the servant. Here it shows us the prophet Isaiah sharing that Israel in exile is not really capable at that moment of living up to what it means to be Israel. But there is a promised servant, a person. The moment of discovery of this was in Isaiah 48, 1 and 2. We did not read those. I'd like to read those to you. Understand this point. This is the first two verses, chapter 48. God tells us through Isaiah, Listen to this, O house of Jacob, you who are called by the name of Israel, and come from the line of Judah, you who take oaths in the name of the Lord, and invoke the God of Israel, but not in truth or righteousness. You who call yourselves citizens of the holy city and rely on the God of Israel, the Lord Almighty is his name. And the evidence follows in chapter 48, verses 3 through 8. I'd just like to hit some highlights. He starts out with, you guys are not honoring the name of Israel. Chapter 48, starting in verse 3. He says, I foretold the former things, my mouth announced them, and I acted. Verse 4, for I knew how stubborn you were. The sinews of your neck were iron, your forehead was bronze. Does that speak stubbornness and rebellion? Big time. Yeah, that's like us. But that's how they were. In verse 5, the last part of it, you could not say my idols did them. Were they idolatrous people? Yes, they were. 
Verse 8, you have neither heard nor understood, for from of old your ear has not been open. Your ear has not been open. Someone speaking, if the word is important, your ear needs to be open. Well do I know how treacherous you are. You were called a rebel from birth. That's the painting of Israel in exile. So exiled Israel, it looks like, forfeited the right to the name, but God has brought his servant in chapter 49. And the Lord will find a true and worthy Israel, this servant that will display his splendor. The interlinear in the Hebrew says in verse 3, the words, you in whom I shall be glorified. It can also mean display my splendor. Now the term display my splendor occurs 13 times in the Old Testament, nine in the book of Isaiah. It's an important topic. The commentator Alec Motyer says, on most occasions of the use of this term, the Lord shows his splendor by what he does for his people. But here in chapter 49, it is what is done for God. The servant will show God's splendor. In other places, the plural usage of the term is used, but here the servant singular is the focus. This is never said to any prophet or individual or to Israel or any group within Israel. Isaiah says a unique thing about a unique person. Going on in verse 4. Verse 4 kind of shifts gears on us. We go, why is this here? Things are so promising. Verse 4 says, I have labored in vain. I have spent strength for nothing in vain. It shows despondency. You have effort given and there's no achievement. Have you been there? Given effort and not seen achievement? I have. We all have. What is the antidote? The second half of verse 4. The antidote to this despondency is, Yet surely my just reward is with the Lord and my work with my God. Note that this is a contrast to convey the thought that it is for the Lord to decide, not me, and for him to give the reward for the labor. Pastor knows well how often you preach, how often you teach. You know if you witness to your friends and you labor in the word, you labor in prayer, And there doesn't seem to be a reward. The antidote is here. The antidote is the wisdom of God. The servant turns from his own wisdom and rests in the God who called and appointed him. We need to learn. We need to learn. As the called servant, have we been faithful in laboring and spending ourselves, realizing it is the Lord who will bring the fruit that he wants out of it. Resting faith is the answer to despondency. In this, we see that Isaiah foresaw a servant with a real human nature, tested like we are, and proving himself to be the author and perfecter of the way of faith. A real personal faith that can still say, my God, when nothing any longer seems worthwhile. Can we walk faithfully in times of trouble and reach for the divine antidote? It's here. It's here. Going into verses 5 and 6. And now the Lord says, He who formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him, and that Israel might be gathered to him, for I am honored in the eyes of the Lord, and my God has become my strength. Indeed, he says, It is too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel. I will also give you as a light to the Gentiles that you should be my salvation to the ends of the earth. Those two verses have been read three times this morning. Let's note a couple points. Isaiah declared that salvation would reach to the ends of the earth through Jesus Christ. Did we not learn some of that this morning as we studied Acts in Sunday school? The ends of the earth. His kingdom is not just for Jerusalem, just for Judea. It's the ends of the earth. The Son would purchase people out of every tribe, race, language, and people. We see that in Revelation 5, verse 9. 
This suffering servant that's described in Isaiah intercedes with the Father on behalf of the elect, asking that saving grace would accrue to them. The Father is represented as answering his servant's petition by assisting him in the success of his saving work of redemption. Calvin comments, This makes it clearer still that all that had formerly been said was promised to Christ, not for the sake of his personal advantage, but on our behalf. He has been appointed to be the mediator of the covenant because the Jews by their sins had revolted against God who had made an everlasting covenant with them. It is Christ who renewed that covenant that had been broken or dissolved. At the appointed time, God the Father answers his servant's request and pours out forgiving grace upon all those represented by the Son before his throne above. We also see in verses 5 and 6 the people of Israel. This isn't the man Israel, this is the people Israel. The people of Israel as a whole, they were supposed to be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. You can see that in Exodus 19 and verse 6. The priests of the order of Aaron were to be imitators of God and his divine order. The people in turn were to be imitators of the priests. Moreover, the command in Leviticus 19 and verse 2, be holy because I, the Lord your God, am holy, was directed to everyone. Each person individually was to imitate God in holiness, and the nation as a whole was to be a holy nation imitating God corporately. This is not mysterious. It is theological. God had acted in Exodus to redeem Israel and called them to be in fellowship with him. Through the Red Sea, building of the tabernacle, the cloud, the manna, and other elements of the Moses' leadership, he blessed them and distinguished them from all other people. And if you look at Deuteronomy chapter 7, starting in verse 7 to verse 11, God says that very thing. I distinguish you from all other people by these things that I have done. Therefore, they were to live in conformity as the special people of God. Every aspect of their lives should have been transformed. Their relation to God, using the tabernacle. Their future expectation, possessing the land. Their attitude of pride or coveting. Deuteronomy 8 and verse 10 and following. Talk about that. Transform your life, your attitude. The use of the land In Leviticus 25, verse 23, as a special people of God, every aspect needs to be transformed. Leviticus 18, their sexual relations. Deuteronomy 11, their diet. Deuteronomy 24, their farming practices. Deuteronomy 23 and 24, their use of money. Leviticus 19, their social relations to one another. These things were all supposed to be in conformity to God as his special people, and he gave them instructions. This is what you're supposed to do. In these respects, Israel was intended to model the character of God and thus be a witness to surrounding nations. They were told, observe them, these laws, carefully, For this will show your wisdom and understanding to the nations who will hear about all these decrees and say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. What other nation is so great as to have their gods near them the way the Lord our God is near us? Deuteronomy 4, 6 and 7. As priests, in a broad sense, they... The old Israel Jews would be mediators of the presence of God to the other nations. God had promised Abraham, all people on earth will be blessed through you. Genesis 12, 3. Israel was not only a nation of priests, but God's firstborn son, Deuteronomy 8, 5. Israel failed to live in obedience to God. She was corrupted by injustice. We started the study in Isaiah, Isaiah 1, 21. And I'd like to read that, Isaiah 121. See how the faithful city has become a harlot. She was once full of justice, 
Remember that word from Isaiah 49? She once was full of justice. Righteousness used to dwell in her, but now murderers. Her very failure testified to the need for a final obedient son who would come from the line of David and would establish justice. Isaiah 11, 1 through 5, and Isaiah 9, 6 and 7. He will come from the line of David and he will establish justice. Here in Isaiah in 49, God promises to raise up his servant whom he names Israel, but who will also bring Jacob back to him in verse 5. Injustice and impurity are cleansed. That's a promise in Isaiah 4, 4. By the servant's death as a sacrificial lamb, we will get there in Isaiah 53. His death as a sacrificial lamb. Isaiah is speaking about the work of Jesus Christ. Christ is the final definitive seed of Abraham. You can find that in Galatians 3.16. Say it again. Christ is the final definitive seed of Abraham. And when Christ comes, Matthew states that his life is patterned after the life of Israel the Son. I'd like you to turn, I'm going to read Matthew chapter 2 and verse 15. Matthew 2 and verse 15. 15 starts in 14, forgive me. I'm going to go back to 14. So this is the story of Joseph and Mary. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt, verse 15, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet. Out of Egypt, I called my son. We know the story of God going to Pharaoh by Moses, ten plagues, ten curses. Pharaoh releases Israel, and they go through the Red Sea. Out of Egypt, he calls his son. Jesus Christ, out of Egypt, he calls his son. So the thought is that the servant's life is patterned after the life of Israel, the son, or rather, think about this, he notes that the Old Testament history of Israel was patterned after the true and final son. The church in turn is patterned after the fullness of Christ. We read that in Ephesians 4. And if you'll bear with me, I'd like to read this. Ephesians chapter 4. And we'll start in verse 7. And we'll read a few verses. So again, the thought is the church is patterned after the fullness of Christ. Ephesians 4, starting in verse 7. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he led captives in his train and gave gifts to men. What does he ascended mean, except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. Verse 11, it was he who gave some to be apostles some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors and teachers, to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of men and their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head, that is, Christ. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every sporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. The experience of Christians is thus in a way like an analogy to that of Israel. And I won't go into it, but you could look at 1 Corinthians 10, Hebrews 12, and Galatians 4. Our experience as Christian believers 
is analogous to that of Israel. We note that Israel is a type pointing to Christ, first of all, and only through Christ to the church. Jesus' commandment in Matthew 28, 19, and 20 says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Jesus, his description of his witness's destination echoes God's ancient promise to the suffering servant. It is too small a thing. I will also make you a light for the Gentiles that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. Because in Matthew, he says, you make disciples of all nations. All nations. Let's get back to the point that was brought up early. What hope does Israel have if there is no peace for the wicked? This servant song clarifies for us that the servant is not Israel because the servant will bring Israel back to God. This servant in chapter 49 will be given worldwide recognition. He will be a prophet, but more than a prophet, because in him, God will display his beauty, his glory. His message will fall on deaf ears in Israel, yet the Lord will vindicate him. He is a light for the nations, bringing salvation to the ends of the earth. He will be given as a covenant to God's people, guiding peoples from every nation by springs of water and displaying God's comfort and compassion to all creation. In summary, we started this message with two things, the who and the what. In summary, the servant is a true servant, the who. A revealer of truth, perfect, obedient, and explicitly a substitutionary sin bearer who voluntarily dies and lives again to clothe his people with his own righteousness. The gospel is to conquer the world. That is the what. The gospel is to conquer the world. Folks, we are seeing the links to which the Holy One of Israel will go to deal with sin, reclaim the sinner, and create or form a righteous people for himself. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for your mercy and your grace.